Good morning. We're going to call the Agriculture and Food Finance and Policy. Thank you, everyone who's here today. Prompt and um, in this very cold and blustery weather that we're having, I appreciate that we've got a number of people in the audience, including a number of FFA members. So we have the FFA Ag Policy Experience happening. These students uh, committed to this long before they knew what the weather is going to be like and the fact that they might have the possibility of school, um, not having school. So we appreciate that you have come and that you are here uh, experiencing ag policy in this committee and that you'll have the opportunity, some of you, to be able to testify later on a bill. So thank you for coming and hopefully you enjoy um, the next hour and a half of our meeting. So um, we are going to uh, do a couple of things today. One is everybody has gotten a, a budget book. This is our start of talking about the budget and talking about some of the um, uh, aspects of our budget. We've got uh, the Board of Animal Health today and AURI that are going to be presenting and giving us information. Um, over the coming weeks, we'll hear more about the funding proposals from the governor's budget and from the Department of Ag's budget. And um, we will also, so these budget books are, are kind of ours to keep here um, on the cart. We'll, we'll have them uh, so if you have a, a request to get any information from them, please let us know and we can do that. Otherwise, we're going to keep the budget books and then um, you don't have to haul them back and forth with you and leave them in your office. So um, just so you're aware of that. But today we're going to get started. The Board of Animal Health is here. They're going to just provide a little bit of a, um, a budget and function overview and uh, give us an update on some animal disease issues that um, have been going on as well. So um, Dr. Thompson is here and I'm going to ask her to kind of get, uh, you know what, while we're waiting here, I'm going to have um, uh, Representative Wozniak, have you been able to review the minutes and would you like to move the minutes? Yes, I have. I would like to move to adopt the minutes from the January 24th meeting. Thank you. So a, a motion has been made to move the January 24th minutes. Um, any corrections or additions? Seeing none, then all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails and the minutes are approved. So welcome to the committee. Um, Dr. Thompson, we're just going to turn it over to you and let you um, give us the presentation. So if you'd go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair Poppy. Members of the committee, my name is Beth Thompson. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Board of Animal Health and State Veterinarian. Uh, we appreciate uh, this opportunity to come before you today, give you an overview of what the board does here in the state of Minnesota. I also have Morgan Grelson with me. He's the business manager, and he will be testifying later on in the presentation regarding our budget. And, and welcome, too, to the FFAers. I didn't realize I was going to have a big audience today like this. <laughs> So the Board of Animal Health was established in 1903. Uh, agriculture has always been important to the state of Minnesota. It's a backbone of what we are and what we do. And I have, I'm kind of a history buff. So I was reading through a, a egg. Uh, it was a, a information that was given to the Historical Society from J.J. Hill back in, I think it was 1897 or thereabouts. I was reading this this weekend, and it, there was a paragraph out of his presentation that hit me. And this is from J.J. Hill. Uh, the, farmer, the farmers in Iowa are plagued with hog cholera. We were having more of it in this state than we ought to have. Though I for years believed it would never bother us in this state, I now know that it can be carried. Even in the clothes of a man, can carry, be carried by a dog, can be carried by sheep and cattle. I brought a carload of cars from our cows from northern Iowa last spring, dairy cattle, took them out to my farm, and within three weeks had the first case of hog cholera and lost about 80 little pigs. I quarantined at once, and with the aid of the state veterinarian, Dr. Reynolds, was able to stamp it out. But I would have lost my entire herd of pigs. So throughout history, whether it was hog cholera or glanders or tuberculosis, uh, the state of Minnesota has put a, 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 a information, the, the information that we have using the state veterinarian and for tackling these diseases that are out there. 
We are a board. Uh, the governor appoint, appoints our five-member board. Uh, working from the, the left of the screen is uh, our current board president or chair, Dean Compart. He's a hog producer from the southern part of the state. Uh, next to him is Peter Ripka. He's from more of the central part of the state, a dairy farmer. In the middle is our newest board member, Erica Swatsky. She is a turkey producer from out in the Wilmer area. Uh, next to her is one of our veterinarian members, Dr. Graham Brayshaw. He works with the Golden Valley Humane Society. And then last but of course not least, Dr. Matt Anderson is on the far right hand side of the screen. Dr. Matt Anderson is a large animal veterinarian down in my area of the state, down near Zambroda. And he also uh, helps us out because he works with the, the livestock market down in Zambroda. So in addition to our board members, we also by statute have consultants to the Board of Animal Health. Uh, those consultants include the Commissioners of Agriculture, Health, and the Department of Natural Resources, uh, the Director of the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, and also the Dean of the College of Vet Med. In addition to that, the board also utilizes task forces and committees. And right now, a couple of our committees that are very active are the committee that's working on commercial dog and cat breeders, a program of excellence. We also have the EDMC, the Emergency Disease Management Committee, which works with our poultry producers. As you all may know, we've had low path avian influenza in the state this past year. And then in addition to that, we also have a farm servant task force. <coughs> This is our org chart. We are a small agency. We usually um, range right around 40 uh, employees. Starting over on the left-hand side of the screen um, and moving in one box, we have two of our veterinarians that work out at the poultry testing laboratory in Wilmer. That would be Dr. Shauna Voss and Dr. Dale Lauer. And then their employees are listed below them. Uh, the folks up there that are listed in green are our field staff. We have 13 field staff. We have one position that's open right now. Uh, and they are both veterinarians and non-veterinarians that are located throughout the state. And then the rest of the staff are located here in St. Paul. And this would be a good time to mention too, we also utilize USDA field staff throughout the state. There's a handful of veterinarians and non-veterinarians on the USDA side that help us out with some of the board programs. The basis of what we do at the board starts out with testing and the University of Minnesota Veterinary Diagnostic Lab is the official laboratory for the Board of Animal Health. Uh, the VDL as we call it is a, a national leader, it's a full service diagnostic lab located here in St. Paul. And then in addition to that, the Minnesota Poultry Testing Laboratory, the lab that I've already mentioned, is also part of the VDL. That's a, a cooperative effort between the University of Minnesota and the Board of Animal Health. And out at the MPTL, they serve as the authorized lab for the National Poultry Improvement Plan for Minnesota, and they administer that plan. It's called the NPIP. Uh, testing out at the Poultry Testing Laboratory includes salmonella, influenza, mycoplasma, and again, it was, it was such a wonderful thing that happened uh, with the, the monies that came from the legislature and, and the governor's office back in 2015 and 16, that expansion to that laboratory out in Wilmer so we can better serve the poultry producers here in the state of Minnesota. What we do is detect, control, and eradicate disease. The board looks to and works with experts to do these tasks, uh, we look to our researchers, uh, both at the University of Minnesota, uh, all of those researchers located here in the state of Minnesota and other states, uh, working to identify current or emerging diseases. We also partner with our other state agencies, and I have a slide and a few, uh, few more slides that I, I, can, I can show you what we do. Uh, in addition to that, it, but most importantly, uh, is the collaboration that we have with those folks, those boots on the ground the producers, livestock producers throughout the state of Minnesota, and also all of the veterinarians. When I first started at the board over uh, about 12 years ago now, I think, um, we, we, we were working, we were beginning working on uh, import standards. And uh, I, I think back to uh, if any of you are livestock producers or have moved animals, companion animals, uh, there's a certificate of veterinary inspection that's required when animals move from one state to another. When I started, it was a piece of paper. 
Now, with technology and with the smart minds that know the technology, we've moved those CVIs into an electronic format. So now producers, uh, small animal, if you're moving your companion animal across state lines, you can use uh, one of those two methods. And in addition to that, we've also used technology for that official identification that's required for animals moving across state lines. So if, for example, I'm going to move a, a cow from South Dakota uh, down to my farm near Zimbroda, uh, they could wand that RFID tag, that radio frequency tag, get that information and put that on either that piece of paper that's moving with the cow or transmit that electronically. Again, in the last 10, 15 years, huge strides have been made both here in Minnesota but also across the United States for animal movement purposes. So this was a slide that I had mentioned before, before I, I talk any more about our emergency planning and preparedness, an example of how we work with other state agencies. Uh, that picture that you see up on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, there are three state agencies represented in just the four people that are standing there in, in that picture. And that picture was taken during the ARMAR exercise this past year, and that stands for the Ag Response Management and Resources Exercise that was held in the spring of 2018. This was a national exercise to take a look at what we all would do during a foot and mouth disease outbreak. It was a three-day exercise. Uh, there were over 1,700 people involved across the United States coming from 13 different states. And it started out with an introduction of foot and mouth disease, which is a foreign animal disease, uh, being located in a small herd out in Montana. And as we worked through that exercise, more herds were discovered in other states, and it really tested what we do every day in preparation for such a disease. Um, in Minnesota, too, we brought together our livestock commodity groups into that room so that they could see what it is that the Board of Animal Health the Department of Agriculture, Department of DNR, or Natural Resources, all of the different state agencies that were involved in that response. When we talk about emergency response, the one thing that we, we must um, acknowledge is that there are really two different parts to that response. There is the response that happens on the infected premises. And usually at that point, you've got a herd or flock that's quarantined. Uh, you've got the various regulatory personnel that are coming to that farm. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's the epi investigations that occur. There's all sorts of activity on that farm. But on this slide, we're talking about the secure food supply plans. That, those plans are for the people that are not infected but affected. Uh, if you go back to 2015, when we had highly pathogenic avian influenza within this state, uh, there were many affected producers located throughout the state. And we looked to, on the bottom of that list for that outbreak, the secure poultry supply plan. It was that information about the biosecurity on those affected sites, the information that they had about where things were moving, that we were able to go to and allow those people to continue their business. So when a foreign animal disease is diagnosed, either here in Minnesota, in the Midwest, or across the United States, it's imperative for our farmers to be prepared. And that's what these secure food supply plans do. Uh, these plans are supported by science, and the board is doing a, a variety of different tasks related to each one of these plans. Moving on, uh, current events. Um, as I mentioned, we are working with the various livestock groups on the secure food supply plans. Um, I, was, I was just out in Pipestone about, I think it was 10 days ago, whenever they got the 10, 12 inches of snow out there. Um, we brought together the uh, state veterinarians from South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and myself to sit down and talk with some producers about the secure food supply plan, specifically the secure pork supply plan. Uh, we're doing a lot of that work, and we're also uh, supporting what it is each one of those commodity groups is doing. Uh, we're also teaming up with the Department of Health on the Longhorn Tick. Uh, this is something that uh, caught our attention uh, back in 2017. The Longhorn Tick was identified in New Jersey in a sheep flock. 
Uh, it seems that it, it's been in the United States probably longer than 2017, but this is not a native tick to um, uh, United States. It's, it's native to Asia and also New Zealand and Australia have some problems with this tick. And of course, it's a tick, so it can carry certain diseases. It can affect people. So this next spring, the Board of Animal Health and the Department of Health are going to be working on educational pieces uh, going out to both our producers and to the general public. Third on the list, responding to low path avian influenza. We did have diagnoses of avian influenza in the state of Minnesota this last October. There is a big difference between high path avian influenza, which we saw back in 2015, and low path avian influenza. Low pathogenic avian influenza generally does not make birds sick. Uh, so what we do with those flocks, and there were a total of nine flocks, uh, what we do with those flocks is continually surveil them, uh, meaning that we test them, and once they've cleared the virus, they can then go on to slaughter. Uh, and then at the last two bullets on this slide, I'll, I'll cover a little bit more in, in some additional slides, but we're also monitoring African swine fever and then carrying out and making changes uh, carrying out the audit recommendations on our survey program and making programmatic changes. So African swine fever, uh, amongst the diseases that uh, wake me up in the middle of the night and keep me awake, uh, this is one of them. Uh, this is a disease that if we were to find it within North America, within the United States, uh, it would be a, a unbelievably huge detriment to our hog industry. Uh, African swine fever only affects hogs. Uh, this is a, a disease that is specific to them, but as you all may know, not in Minnesota, but in other parts of the United States, not only are there commercial herds, but there's also the wild hog population. Uh, what we're seeing, and the map that's up in front of you right now, um, was an outbreak of African swine fever located in China. And this dates back to August of 2018 with the first reported case. But if you look at China on that map now, uh, it's basically spread across the majority of that country. Uh, this disease will more than likely cause hogs to die. If not, they get very sick and they need to be depopulated. There is no vaccine, there is no treatment. And it's my understanding that hog industry, the hog industry in the United States today uh, exports almost 30% of their hogs. And if we were to have this disease, it would be a severe trade limitation for our hog producers. So biosecurity is key for our hog producers, but also, as I mentioned in, in a couple of slides back, having those secure plans in place and also having the testing available, uh, the understanding of that disease so we can respond. And then on to our farm servid program. Uh, the Minnesota law that directs board involvement or board oversight of this program uh, went into effect in January of 2004. Uh, and Farm servants within the state of Minnesota, and we've got a list up there, deer, elk, moose, reindeer, they are considered livestock within the state of Minnesota. The regulations for this program are located in our chapter, Chapter 35. Uh, the list up there including registration, annual inspection, uh, response to escape farm servants or wild servants that again get into a farm servant enclosure, Fencing, identification, chronic wasting disease surveillance, and the importation of farm servants is all located within that chapter. And then the rules that are associated with that portion of Chapter 35 are listed up there also. Uh, if you are interested, uh, we have forms on our website that go into great detail on our farm servant program. Uh, and, and they also include guidance, including the registration form, inventory report, uh, fawn and calf inventory reports, inspection guidelines, our laws and rules, and also our farm servant handbook. Dr. Thompson, I'm just going to interrupt you for a moment. I think Representative Eklund has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, the far, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson. The farm uh, uh, farm servants issue. 
Do you apply the same import standards to livestock, to the cervids that may come from another state that a farm is importing as what you talked about earlier? Dr. Thompson. No, Madam Chair, representative members of the committee, every species has a different import standard. Uh, for example, there are increased import regulations for animals moving out of the brucellosis zone out west. With farm cervidae, uh, they need to come from an area <clears throat> excuse me, that is non-endemic for chronic wasting disease. Uh, there are, is also a permit process that's in place so that before the animals move, they have to be calling for permits. And there is communication between the board here in Minnesota and with the other state where those animals are coming from. And if I might, I also, that's a, with that one of the handouts that we gave you, there's information on the middle of the first page regarding the farm servant imports that have come into the state of Minnesota. Uh, the informa information there is from fiscal year 18, I believe. All right, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, it was interesting going through the some of the prior livestock diseases. I think when we had bovine tuberculosis and high pathogenic avian influenza, the, re the response was to kill all the animals, kill all the animals within the fence. Uh, but it's clear with chronic waste and disease in the farm servant industry that we do not kill all the animals in the fence. In fact, we've set up all of this accommodation for the industry where they don't, where they're not treated the same way as we've treated other livestock. Uh, the people of Minnesota have paid $450,000 to monitor around a captive deer farm, $150,000 each year to monitor outside of it because the farmer refused to depopulate when they had a positive deer. So I think the standard needs to be equal, that if there is a, a contaminated deer, and we know now from testimony last week that chronic waste and disease is transmissible through inanimate objects. So I want everybody to think about what that means. That means the location is a biohazard. And we don't know how long this lasts. So Madam Chair and members, I think we have to look at some very serious uh, questions here that we don't want to think about but at a minimum, we need to start thinking about how do we treat farm cervids like we treat other livestock in terms of the response and the responsibilities. Dr. Thompson, if you have comments about that. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Hanson, members of the committee, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that is a correct statement that the, the board does not have regulations requiring the depopulation of a farm cervid herd if it is diagnosed with chronic wasting disease. That is a correct statement. Right. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. So go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Lewick. Uh, do we have any other domestic livestock uh, that are, are treated in a similar manner? In other words, if you do have a positive tuberculosis animal in a uh, livestock herd, um, how does the federal government the state of Minnesota treat that? Is it automatic? They're all going to be killed? Dr. Thompson. Madam Chair, Representative, members of the committee, generally speaking, if we think back to the uh, mid-2000s and when we did have bovine tuberculosis within the state, a herd would be quarantined and then they would be quarantined to slaughter. They would not move to another premises. Um, it may not happen exactly at the same time. Uh, they might be fed out, but yes, they would be moved on to slaughter. So, uh, Dr. Thomas, is that, is that uh, so occasionally we have dairy herds in other parts of the United States. We've been fortunate enough not to have tuberculosis in a dairy herd in Minnesota in quite some time, but uh, we do have dairy herds uh, that are under surveillance out there or have been. Maybe, they probably are off now because uh, it's usually a five-year thing, uh, but I would just uh, uh, be a little cautious on the... Uh, on the blanket statements that uh, my friend uh, Representative Hansen laid out about uh, how uh, those animal diseases are treated, uh, 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 you know, 
know, there's uh, there's a little bit different approach uh, depending on what type of livestock, uh, particularly for, for tuberculosis, uh, than uh, kind of the blanket statement that uh, Representative Hansen uh, put forward. And that's uh, my uh, observation of watching this very closely for 20 years and being directly involved. All right. Um, Dr. Thompson, otherwise you can respond if there's any. I don't know that there's a question, but if you have a comment regarding that, and then otherwise, I think you can continue with the presentation. All right. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, and just a, a follow-up comment that is a very good observation in that the, the federal government does allow uh, dairy herds, other herds, if they're infected with bovine tuberculosis, to do the test and removal program, which does take a, a period of time. Uh, Minnesota, we didn't take that advantage of that during tuberculosis, but yes, in other, other parts of the country that has happened. And then the last, Ed, I believe this is the last slide that I have, members of the committee, the, the mandatory chronic wasting disease surveillance that is done in our farm surveyed, uh program. 100% uh, surveillance is required by the statute. Samples can be taken by the producer, by the veterinarian. Uh, if we have field staff in the area that can help out with that, uh, they can certainly go to that farm and help out with the uh, taking of the sample. And also the producer can submit the whole head to the veterinary diagnostic lab, but that is at an extra cost. Uh, we are planning to have uh, additional training for producers, veterinarians coming up this, this year in 2019. Uh, so that we can do some further um, information, pushing out that uh, how to do that uh, testing, because it is it is some, somewhat difficult for some of that testing. Because uh, as many of you are aware, uh, when you test for CWD, it's on a dead animal. Uh, and not only do lymph nodes need to be taken for this program, but also a part of the brain stem. And with that, unless there are more questions, I believe uh, our business manager would like to. Uh, Representative Anderson has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, that's the topic of the survey day. who has been uh, around a while and discussed for a while. And as I understand, the Board of Animal Health has uh, responsibility for the animals inside the fence and DNR for those outside the fence, the, the wild deer. And it was recommended that uh, communication lines be improved and more work together with DNR. What's being done in terms of working together with, with the other agency and uh, trying to get a better handle on this situation. Dr. Thompson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, members of the committee, uh, there's a lot of work that has been done. We continue to do in that area. Uh, specifically, we brought together our, I'll call them program managers from the two agencies. Uh, they had a, a number of meetings together and we've entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Natural Resources, uh, really carrying through on some of what was seen out of the, the legislative audit. Uh, some of the areas that were covered by those discussions include escapes, uh, the sharing of information from chronic wasting disease testing, and, and general data sharing between the two agencies. Uh, but they continue to work together uh, on those issues. Okay, Representative Poston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Thompson, um, I was uh, reading the OLA's report on the Board of Animal Health yesterday, and one of the recommendations was, uh, was to increase your board size. Uh, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, what your plans are on that, um, if you foresee a change. Dr. Thompson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, and members of the committee, uh, we have not, as an agency, made any movement on changing that board size. We look to our board members for recommendations on that, and of course, any legislative body that would see fit. Representative Poston. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, we will be proposing removing the survey day responsibility from the Department Board of Animal Health and move it back to the Department of Natural Resources. All right. Um, well, we'll probably need to discuss that at a different point, but um, unless anybody has any other further comments about that right now, um, I think we will continue. And so, Dr. Thompson, um, now. Um, you're turning it over, is that correct? So, I am. Um, thank, 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Morgan Grelson, I'll have him introduce himself. Perfect. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Morgan Grelson, and I'm the business manager with the Board of Animal Health. And I'm going to go over a couple slides uh, with some preliminary information on terms of our budget as uh, it currently is in, our, in the state's uh, budgeting system for fiscal year uh, 20 and fiscal year 21. Um, like most agencies and organizations, our primary cost driver is our uh, salary and benefit costs. Uh, for uh, fiscal year uh, 20, we have uh, about 4.3 million uh, budgeted expenses for our uh, staff and uh, fringe costs and about 4.4 million budgeted for fiscal year 21. The uh, uh, primary uh, fixed costs that we have are with our IT costs of um, about $480,000 and our contracted vendor costs. Um, the, some of our vendors that we have under contract are the, uh, primarily the University of Minnesota for uh, avian testing services, uh, chronic wasting disease testing, uh, and Seneca A uh, testing. We also have a, a, a contract with the Minnesota Veterinary Medical Reserve Corps uh, for uh, leading some emergency preparedness um, and coordination work that they do. So um, in terms of our uh, variable costs, it really the variable costs are with staffing and benefits and our contracted uh, vendors. Um, over the past few years, we've achieved some uh, cost savings in, in Dr. Thompson mentioned it earlier in her, in her presentation, and that is uh, with some efficiencies in technology. So the movement that Dr. Thompson mentioned with uh, going from a paper uh, uh, certificate of veterinary inspection to an electronic version really helps us to uh, more efficiently and effectively uh, gather data, uh, manage the data, and then use the data uh, more efficiently in terms of driving uh, decisions that, uh, that are made in terms of um, uh, how we go about our work. The, um, another reduction uh, over the past few years has been in um, our administrative costs, where uh, several <coughs> years ago we had uh, four assistant directors. We now have two assistant directors. So there's some uh, administrative cost savings that, um, that have been achieved there. Uh, over the past few years, our uh, general appropriations um, have increased uh, by about one and a quarter percent in fiscal year 17, um, and then less than one percent increase in our general appropriation for uh, fiscal year 18 and fiscal year 19. Um, at the same time, uh, like all state agencies, uh, the labor um, costs, our, our staff and benefits, through the, the uh, labor agreements and the pay plans have gone up um, about 2.5% for fiscal year 17, 2% in fiscal year 18, and 2.25% um, for fiscal year 19. And so what we're, we're seeing, in, in addition to that, we um, have reduced funding from the uh, federal government through our um, uh, USDA uh, uh, um, funding. And so that's decreased, the, the USDA funding has decreased about $32,000 over the past several years. So what, we, what the overall impact to our agency is, while we're seeing uh, our costs increase, um, our funding and appropriations um, haven't quite kept up with, the, uh, um, with the, the increases in our expenses. Um, uh, over the past 18 months, um, in part, in order for us to to be able to um, uh, better manage uh, uh, a number of our services, but uh, especially the chronic wasting disease, um, the survey day program, um, we've added additional staff uh, to, to, uh, to improve our uh, oversight of that program. Um, The next slide, so this is the, the slide that we're looking at now, fiscal year 20, then fiscal year 21. Um, and I should note there's a typo on the, the column that lists salaries and fringes. 
so on the right side, it's, it lists at 4.9 million, and actually uh, in the, the pie chart itself is the actual amount that we have uh, budgeted. And again, I just want to uh, uh, remind everyone, these are very preliminary um, budget figures, and when the, um, uh, the budget uh, recommendations from the governor come out um, in February, then we'll be uh, updating these, these figures here. So I don't know if anyone has any, any, any questions regarding our, uh, our budget or our expenses. Um, I think I'll ask a question. Just as it kind of goes back to the CWD and um, the emerging response, emerging funds for um, taking care of things like that. So um, how much money do you have uh, allotted for that and has that been spent down? And how did, um, like, how were things paid for when it you did the special hunts and some of that? Just to describe that a little bit more. Yes. So, um, great question, um, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, and the, the annual fees that we uh, receive from the uh, Farm Survey Day um, inspections are uh, modest. We receive about thirty to $32,000 a year in the fees that we collect. Um, and in fiscal year 18, we spent um, uh, roughly, I have to double check the figures, but um, uh, I believe it was about $600,000 um, to, to regulate that program. And Madam Chair, we can get back to you with more specifics on that Correct. if needed. That's fine, yes, absolutely. Um, As, and yes, go ahead. Chair, committee members. Yes. So the majority of the expenses then that we have for um, uh, our Silver Day program really is coming out of our general um, appropriation. Okay. All right. Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, to either of the testifiers, I guess it's a three-part question, I think. Uh, one, do you believe, are, well, are the laws and rules adequate uh, in the state of Minnesota to address CWD? Uh, is the Board of Animal Health properly equipped to address CWD? And how would the Department of uh, uh, Natural Resources be better equipped to address CWD other than the Board of Animal Health? So it's a three-part question. Dr. Thompson. Madam Chair, Representative Hamilton, members of the committee, um, first of all, are the laws and rules adequate for addressing chronic wasting disease? Uh, there are modifications that could be recommended regarding chronic wasting disease that would better fit uh, dealing with that specific disease. When, this, uh, when the laws were passed back in 2002, chronic wasting disease wasn't the specter that it is now. So I think there are additional modifications that can be made, uh, whether or not, I, I don't, I'm not prepared to make those statements right now, specifically which parts of the statute should be modified. Uh, second question, is the, the board properly equipped to uh, deal with the, the farm survey day industry and also the, the farms in, in the state of Minnesota, specifically to chronic wasting disease? As we see chronic wasting disease spreading, um, I looked up the uh, list of states that now currently have chronic wasting disease in the United States this morning, and it is, it is growing at an alarming rate. And for some of the states, and, and not just farm servants, but also wild servants, uh, some of those states that are beginning to look for chronic wasting disease and finding it, uh, we need to step up our game. So there would be opportunities for additional staff, what we can do to go out and better monitor and better understand chronic wasting disease, uh, specific to the farm survey day industry here in Minnesota, there is room for growth there. In addition to that, and I just have to make a plug for this, is that you know the testing for chronic wasting disease at this point in time, whether it's in the, the farm survey day population or the wild survey day population is on a dead animal. And that puts farm survey day producers at a detriment um, because that animal has to die before they can find out whether or not their herd has chronic wasting disease. Uh, that's not something that the board can handle, but certainly if, if there's uh, research out there that can be done for better testing methods, uh, that would be so important to the farm survey day population. And lastly, um, 
Madam Chair, members of the committee, Representative Hamilton, is the, the Department of Natural Resources better suited to oversee the, the Farm Survey Day program? Uh, again, I would have to I would have to better understand what that would look like, uh, whether or not just moving it into another state agency would actually deal with the disease that we're seeing right now. Um, I can tell you the, the Board of Animal Health, whether we're talking about Farm Survey Day or Wild Survey Day, uh, we don't want this disease in our state. So I think we would share that opinion of we need to do something about uh, the current status of chronic wasting disease. Thank you. Representative, uh, Representative Anderson. Thanks again, Madam Chair. Dr. Thompson, uh, thanks for your, org your uh, organization. You do an excellent job on, on, on these issues, and they're difficult. Picking up on what Representative Hamilton said, and, and you commented about the, the animal has to be, be dead to test it for the disease of CW. Um, it's my understanding that every animal that uh, has slaughtered a survey animal for for consumption for meat. Uh, are they all tested uh, as part of the, the, the slaughtering process for these farm survey? Day? <coughs> Madam Chair, Representative um, Anderson and members of the committee, that is the law that they are to be tested. Um, whether or not, and not specifically slaughter, but whether or not an animal dies within the fence and for some reason is is not seen right away and the sample deteriorates those aren't tested uh, there are the occasional farmers who for whatever reason don't notice when animals are gone or dead uh, so even though the law requires 100 percent testing that is not what happens uh, when they do take them to slaughter plants though yes they, they will take the samples and have them tested representative anderson thanks again madam just one more quick follow-up talked about the you have uh, the authority of, of animals inside the fence, DNR outside the fence. Who monitors to make sure these fences are, are maintained? We hear that occasionally a, a tree falls down and a fence goes with it, and uh, they need to be uh, fixed immediately. But uh, who, who checks up on that, and, or is that just up to the farmer to make sure his fences are okay? Dr. Thompson. Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, members of the committee, it is imperative that the farmer be checking the fences. It is up to the farmer to make sure that the fences are intact. Uh, we certainly don't have staff to visit um, 395 herds across the state to make sure those fences are intact. But we do have enforcement ability. Uh, that is one of the inspection portions that we do inspect for. And we also look to, again, Department of Natural Resources, if they are in the area, they will communicate back to us if there are problems with the fence. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And last year, uh, Representative Anderson, we proposed that DNR have the same authority uh, for to enforce Board of Animal Health uh, regulations, but that uh, made it through a committee but didn't survive uh, uh, one of the omnibus bills. So that would provide for more eyes on the fences if they're out there and could respond maybe quicker because the CO, there's more COs. Uh, so I think that's a minimum thing that we could do to help provide for that. Um, my question is on uh, the committee last week, uh, there was testimony from the veterinary college uh, about uh, that uh, semen would be uh, a bodily fluid that could move chronic waste and disease, the prions would survive in, in semen. So in addition to blood and urine or saliva, um, so if there's interstate transport of semen, um, that could potentially transport prions. So has the board looked at any regulations on interstate uh, transfer sales uh, movement of uh, either semen or other products that may carry the prions. And just before you answer that, um, the, the committee that you're referencing is the Environment Committee. Environment Policy Committee. Environment Policy Committee. So it, it wasn't heard in this committee, but uh, uh, some other members may serve on the committee. So, but Dr. Thompson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, members of the committee, that is a very good point. I also heard that testimony, and that certainly would be on the list of things that the board needs to consider based on the research that's being done. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the presentation this morning.
appreciate that you were able to come and do this. And um, I think that this will be an issue. The CWD issue is one that we are likely to bring up again and have further conversation about. But thank you. For your thank you, Madam Chair. Today. Thank you, members. Thank you. And for members, um, just so you know that these have three hole punches in them, so you can put them in this budget book. So if you um, want to take it with you, you can, but then know that it won't be in your book. So if you want to take the time, um, either now or at the end of the uh, committee meeting today, that you will want to put that in, into the division book, the budget book. And next, we have the Agriculture Utilization Research Institute, AURI. Um, Shannon Schlecht is here and Dan Skogan, so we're going to have a presentation again, uh, kind of the overview of the function of AURI, uh, the purpose, the, the history perhaps, and also then a bit of the, the budget, as that also falls under this committee's jurisdiction. So welcome to the committee, and if you'll just identify yourself and begin your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Dan Scogan, uh, Government Relations Director uh, for AURI, the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. Great to be before the committee again. Uh, AURI has a long history with the state legislature. It was uh, some 30 years ago when the state of Minnesota was going through an ag crisis, and we had very similar reaction to the ag crisis, and uh, the legislature in its wisdom created AURI to add value to commodities that are grown in Minnesota. And uh, here to tell that story today, I have with me the Executive Director of the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute, Shannon Schlecht. We also have with us today a board member who represents agribusiness, and he'll make a brief comment at the end, and we'll stand for questions. But uh, at this time, Madam Chair, I turn it over to Shannon. Yes, Mr. Schlecht, welcome to the committee. Great, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Shannon Schlecht. I'm the Executive Director of the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. And it is a pleasure to be here today to talk about what ARI is doing for the state of Minnesota, uh, for the economy, and for the agricultural industry to advance opportunities uh, for our producers and for agricultural products. I just want to start out that I, I feel ARI is a very unique organization. Uh, as I've um, uh, been at ARI for a little over three years, I think we are the envy of other states in terms of the investment that's been made in value-added agriculture, creating new demand opportunities, uh, and the resources and the partnership that has existed for nearly 30 years, as uh, Mr. Skogan mentioned. So ARI was, was formed nearly 30 years ago. Our main focus is really about value-added agriculture. Uh, we do very little on the production agriculture side. It's all about creating disappearance, uh, new utilization of, of commodities and egg products that are produced here within the state of Minnesota. We drive new sales uh, activity for businesses. Uh, we look for disappearance and utilization opportunities for producers. Uh, we help um, create jobs, uh, of course, and uh, we look at what are underutilized or um, ways that we can rethink about our commodities in terms of uh, creating, those, creating those new opportunities. Um, we provide service uh, to those entities, uh, to our producers, uh, to empower them to think about if they have an idea, how do we go about commercializing that? Uh, what are some of the hurdles that exist? What can ARI do? What can we do with our partners uh, and our network to help turn that idea into a commercial reality? We provide a, a unique set of services uh, to make this all, all happen. Uh, we work mainly to respond to industry needs uh, through our commercialization services program. Uh, but we also do a lot of proactive work through our public initiatives to put new information uh, out to the industry and out to our producers around opportunities that we see uh, through our activities, through our conferences, through our literature reviews that we do uh, around well, how can we look at these commodities uh, and new uses and then create some economic opportunities. So a lot of it is overcoming technical hurdles. Uh, when I look at our staff of scientists uh, and business developers that we have, around identifying those, those hurdles and then looking at what resources that exist within ARI within the state to overcome them. So they can be technical hurdles through uh, analytical work, uh, laboratories, uh, the research that's needed to uh, move from a proof of concept into a scale-up opportunity. Uh, it can be through our network to get them connected to the right resources at the right time and with the right people uh, that have the, the additional expertise to help move those ideas forward. Uh, I also want to add in, in 2018, we did um, have a small change to some of our services that, that we offered. And I'll talk about our programs uh, later on in the presentation. But we did switch to a, a fee-for-service model in 2018, uh, which was a recommendation of the, the legislative auditor. Uh, and that has um, 
uh, changed a little bit in terms of how we scope our projects and how we uh, work with businesses in terms of more of a stage gate approach uh, to uh, um, advance them and to, to rethink about how we how we meet those objectives. Uh, those are subsidized rates to Minnesota companies. Uh, so the smaller you are, the higher the subsidy is to uh, provide those resources to help moving that opportunity and that idea forward. We've had a long relationship with the legislature, as uh, Dan mentioned, uh, nearly 30 years ago uh, that we were created during the farm crisis. Uh, originally created as uh, part of the Greater Minnesota Corporation. Uh, and then uh, spun off a couple years later into a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, and we continue to have um, a lot of interaction with the legislature. We uh, submit a report on our activities every year uh, to, to the legislature. And we also have um, members of the legislature that serve on our board of directors. Uh, and as we uh, uh, look at our current board of directors, uh, we welcome Chair Poppy uh, to the board uh, here starting this uh, with this term. Uh, and uh, we also thank Representative Keel for her past four years of service and Representative Hamilton as well for her past service to the board of, of ARI. Uh, we have a, a prescribed board uh, per statute uh, representing agricultural interests from across the state. Uh, those are three commodity organizations uh, that currently include soybean, wheat, and beef. Uh, two general farm organizations uh, that are Farm Bureau and Farmers Union. Uh, two agribusiness representatives uh, that are currently Cargill and our uh, Larry Johnson, who you'll hear from, from later, who is very active in the ethanol industry. Uh, and then two years ago, the, the uh, legislature gave us permission to add two at-large members. Uh, and we are just starting that process. We have an at-large member elect uh, that will be uh, hopefully accepting the position relatively shortly. Uh, and then we'll add an, an additional at-large member uh, next year in 2020. So we'll, um, we'll eventually have an 11 member board at ARI that directs our programs, uh, provides oversight to the organization uh, to uh, create the greatest impact possible for, for Minnesota. We are mainly a, a greater Minnesota footprint uh, as well as an organization. Uh, our offices are in Crookston uh, where we have a office space and um, we have a laboratory bench space at the University of Minnesota Crookston that we rent and, and utilize for our microbiological work. Uh, we have a office in laboratory footprint in Marshall with Southwest Minnesota State University uh, where we do a lot of our food work, our analytical testing, and we have a wet lab there for uh, um, uh, renewable fuels uh, to advance those opportunities and ideas as well. Uh, and then we have a pilot facility in Wasika uh, that is mainly focused on densification, dewatering, uh, and uh, looking at egg processing streams in, in terms of new uses, uh, as well as um, an office there as well for staff. Uh, then we do have several virtual staff located across the state as well to provide service to every corner uh, of the state where ideas may, may come from uh, so that we can work with them hand in hand to advance those, those opportunities. We have structured our work uh, under four focus areas uh, to look at what are new market opportunities or overlooked opportunities that we think we can drive uh, that are beneficial and where we have a, a core competency here in Minnesota. Uh, those are in bio-based products and renewable energy, uh, where we are looking at how can we use the crops that are growing here to replace petroleum ingredients uh, into different products. Uh, we have co-products where we're looking at residual streams or waste streams uh, in terms of repurposing them into a, a feed, a fuel, or a fertilizer application to add value uh, to that processing stream um, and to that producer that may, may have waste streams um, such as poultry operations or swine operations uh, where we can repurpose that, that manure stream. Uh, and then we have food, uh, which uh, Minnesota is very well known as a, a food center and a food hub. Uh, and we see a lot of activity in terms of new food product development uh, and unique food uh, products that we can help develop as well. And we keep busy uh, at, at ARI. Uh, last year, we opened 128 projects uh, as an organization. We have a staff of 30. Uh, so we are, are uh, managing a lot of different activities and, and projects uh, across the state. Uh, roughly a half to two thirds of those are under our commercialization services program where we are working uh, with uh, businesses and producers on a uh, more confidential basis to advance their idea. Uh, the other ones are through our networking programs where we're convening and, and pulling people together around opportunities. And then our public initiatives where we are actually driving uh, what we feel are opportunities and trying to get that out into the industry uh, so that they can take it and, and then hopefully create a, a private business opportunity to advance, uh, advance that idea. And then you can see um, 
in our map uh, that we do service almost the entire state uh, over the last uh, seven years. Uh, we have reached almost every corner in terms of uh, projects that we're undertaking. Uh, these are just with um, our clients uh, that we have uh, where we're working to advance an opportunity or an idea that they have brought to us, have been referred to us, uh, where we're trying to uh, then put, put that idea into the commercial marketplace. And we are driven by outcomes and impacts uh, at ARI. Being very close to the, uh, the businesses that we're working with, we're always looking at how can we, again, create utilization, create opportunities, create jobs. Uh, this last year, we had the University of Minnesota Extension do a analysis for us in terms of the impact that we're having across the, the state. Um, over the last six years of, of data that we provided them on our commercialization services program, uh, they found a $310 million impact uh, that ARI had uh, on the state economy. Uh, that includes, of course, the agricultural industry, the service industry, and the construction industry with capital investments uh, that businesses attributed to the services we provided uh, that are, are having an impact on those local communities. Uh, we are also helping create jobs, over 600 jobs uh, that were attributed to, to work that ARI did for these clients and businesses. Uh, and each year, roughly $142 million dollars uh, and economic activity. That's, that's each year that we're helping provide uh, through new business creation, new ideas that have come to the marketplace. Uh, so when we look at that as a, a return on investment for the, the $3.7 million that the state provides, that's, that's a, around a 40 to one return uh, in the dollars that are invested into to ARI. And just a, a quick look at our financial statement uh, for the past year. This is an, an audited financial statement. Uh, we had revenues of about $4.4 million uh, last year, uh, expenses of, of just uh, nearly $4.6 million. Uh, so we did have a, a deficit spend uh, last year. We've had a, a lot of activity coming at us, uh, and we needed to, to dip into reserves uh, as well to, to service those clients. We've been having wait lists for a period of uh, uh, the last couple of years, and we finally turned the corner on that with the addition of some new staff uh, and some new processes in, in place as well. I'll speak um, quickly to some of our, our program areas uh, where we are working to, to drive impact. Uh, they are mainly in, in five areas that we categorize them in. Uh, those are public initiatives, uh, commercialization services, uh, the Ag Innovation Partnership Program, our Entrepreneur and Residence Program, and then our Innovation Networking Program. And I'll, I'll give a few examples of, of what we're doing uh, in each of those areas to, to drive outcomes and, and impacts uh, for the state and for the agricultural industry. Uh, first of all, our, our commercialization services program, uh, just an example here of, of Smoothies brand uh, out of Piers, Minnesota. Uh, they um, have been in, um, came to us early on, maybe 10 years ago, uh, to look at how can we um, uh, create a new opportunity for, for sunflowers. Uh, and uh, they had an idea, uh, they needed a, a feed product. Uh, we helped them with the sunflower oil processing uh, and to help them with nutritional analysis, some labeling analysis. Uh, and they've since just ex continued to expand uh, and have um, gone to a product extension now of microwave popcorn using sunflower oil uh, and continue just to see new opportunities with um, the trends that, that they see, the local food, the clean label, uh, and we've helped them through a lot of that process to put new, uh, new products on the marketplace. Uh, they were our Egg Innovator of the Year this year uh, as well, and we were, were honored to recognize them for the work that they've done and the, the jobs they've created and the, the new demand opportunities they've, they've created for sunflower producers. Uh, we also do public initiatives. Uh, the example here is a, a plant protein report that we worked on with the University of Minnesota. Uh, we were seeing a lot of requests from entrepreneurs around um, ingredient use for plant proteins. Uh, and uh, a lot of food entrepreneurs don't have a food science background and they need uh, more basic information. Uh, so we worked with the U of M to prepare a, um, a basic report around different ingredient options, ingredient formulations. Uh, substitutes that they could look at using with uh, plant proteins and crops that are grown here in Minnesota uh, into their, their, their food products. Our innovation networking program is all about convening um, events and, and opportunities to get the word out uh, about new ideas uh, and possibilities. Uh, last year we hosted our, our second new uses form. Uh, this is a, a convening platform to pull together the food and agricultural innovation ecosystem uh, to talk about um, what's happening and to get people connected with their ideas to the, to the correct resources. We had nearly 200 people uh, at last year's event, uh, which was great to see the, uh, the, out, the outpouring of people from all sides of the state uh, to come and learn about what's happening on the value add and innovation front. Uh, this next year we are partnering with Compere Financial and Georgetown's Rural Opportunity Initiative. Word has gotten out that it's um, 
uh, um, been a, a positive event and I think we'll grow it this year to an even larger number uh, with new opportunities and additional private equity investors coming to look at what are uh, investment opportunities within the, the Minnesota food and agricultural ecosystem as well. Uh, another event we did was uh, the Food and Health Nexus. Uh, and as we look at Minnesota with its rich history in food and its rich history in, in medicine, uh, why not tie those two together? Uh, so we hosted our first event last fall uh, on around You Are What You Eat, uh, looking at different products that can be created that have health attributes or, or disease management. Uh, and we had over 100 people uh, at this first event that came together to learn about what are the possibility, what's, hap what's happening, uh, how do we get connected to the resources to help move some of those ideas forward. Uh, Step One Foods based here in, in Minnesota is a great example where they've created a product uh, to re replace statin drugs uh, through dietary changes with the products that they've created uh, and have gone through the clinical research and everything uh, to, to market that product. So some really innovative things that are, are happening here that we're trying to, uh, to foster and help, help advance. A uh, couple other public initiatives uh, underway uh, that we have are um, our bio-based road sealant uh, that we've talked uh, with, with the committee about before. Uh, this is a, um, a long-term project for us in terms of doing some due diligence and collecting data around uh, how it works and, and the performance. We're partnering with Minnesota Soybean, with Bargain Incorporated, uh, and with a producer down in Missouri as well that's um, utilizing Minnesota quantities actually in, in his production. Uh, we did receive a national grant from the United Soybean Board this past year to expand that, that project to Plymouth uh, to look at trails as well as to Montevideo uh, so that we collect some additional data sites uh, to see how this product is performing uh, over the longer term. And it's mainly soybean based uh, and then uh, roughly 90% bio based uh, to extend the life of, uh, life of roads uh, here in the state and then, uh, in other regions as well. Our industry thought leaders is a, a convening of pulling together the rich um, expertise that exists here to partner entrepreneurs and corporates uh, and having theme discussions around opportunities. Um, our Renewable Energy Roundtable is a, an annual event as well where we look at uh, what are, uh, again, opportunities around biomass uh, and our corn, soybean, oil uh, history we have here in terms of um, uh, new ideas, uh, new innovations that may make those, those projects more efficient. Uh, high oleic oil demonstrations, we're partnering with universities here to do cooking demonstrations to see how so, um, high oleic soybean oil and high oleic uh, sunflower oil and other crops um, uh, can perform. The Forever Green Initiative is a partnership with the University of Minnesota uh, through their cover crop and relay crop program where we're um, part of that, that uh, project to look at the value added opportunities uh, of some of those crops that they're, they're moving forward through their system. Uh, the hemp value chain, I think we've all heard about, a lot about hemp uh, here over the last several years and we are working on a processing guide uh, that we hope to have available by, by March, April uh, that will provide some guidance to um, um, those entities that are looking at investing uh, in hemp processing and, and just um, what are opportunity areas and things that we, should, we need to be thinking about that we can learn from uh, Canada and other states that are moving forward. Uh, and then we'd have food safety process authority that is a need for, uh, for food entrepreneurs and we did a value added meats product as um, product form as well since there's been a lot of focus on plant proteins. We also, of course, are very rich history in uh, traditional proteins and what are ways that we can look at new innovations there. Additionally, our entrepreneur in residence program uh, where we open up our laboratories to entrepreneurs that do not have the, the resources to uh, rent a lab or to buy equipment. Uh, we open up our space uh, to them so that they can, again, work on that idea uh, on proof of concept. Uh, that is usually a, a burdensome cost to them. Uh, so they have access to not only our staff, but also our, our resources uh, that exist in our laboratories. And then we started our Egg Innovation Partnership Program a couple of years ago, where each spring we identify uh, a handful of areas that we see opportunities in, and then look for proposals from partners across the state to, to cost share uh, and moving those public ideas forward. Uh, and um, we've seen a, a nice response to that program as well. Uh, this year we have a, a food packaging guide that we're moving forward as well as a local food ingredient sourcing um, project under AIP uh, that are, are in process. Uh, last year we did a, a school lunch program looking at what are some of the constraints of utilizing more Minnesota value added food products into school lunches and that was a nice um, collaboration and partnership as well with a new audience that we don't typically interact with uh, but we're able to do so through this uh, partnership and then get that information out to uh, food manufacturers. Uh, briefly on our, our legislative update, uh, we are very thankful for the bonding dollars that were awarded to ARI a, a couple of years ago. Uh, we are using those funds to create a new sensory lab in Marshall, Minnesota in, in conjunction with the uh, culinology department at Southwest Minnesota State University. 
Uh, we see that as a, a resource uh, and a need for our food entrepreneurs to provide more objective feedback to their product development uh, that uh, they can have easier access to uh, that type of a, a resource. Uh, and then in Wasika, we um, have been running at a very uh, high capacity uh, in, in Wasika, and we just needed more space. Uh, we were having to move equipment in and out of our pilot lab uh, just because we were had had outgrown our footprint in 25 years. Uh, so uh, we are um, looking at additional space in Wasika to better um, meet the needs of our clients that we see in co-products as well. And then finally, the uh, legislative audit report on our programs that was done in 2016, I'm happy to announce that of the nine recommendations that were made, uh, we have either partially or fully implemented all of those recommendations uh, within uh, the um, up to 2019 here. Uh, so we've made good progress in putting those into place, uh, and I think they have helped make us a better organization as well in terms of uh, efficiency and, and process. And we can't do this alone uh, at ARI. We are one part of a, a large innovation ecosystem uh, that is uh, uh, Minnesota is blessed with. Uh, we work closely with a lot of organizations from the, the, the promotion councils and the producer groups uh, to the university and, and universities uh, to the Department of Agriculture uh, and through several of the other organizations that exist here that are all trying to advance opportunities um, and put Minnesota more on the map as an innovation center for food, food and agriculture. Uh, and it's been, been a great partnership um, with uh, these organizations and most importantly with the legislature uh, through the foresight that, that you've had uh, over the years to advance food and agricultural um, value-added opportunities. So uh, with that, um, there's more that can be, be learned at, at ARI uh, through our website, uh, through discussions. Uh, we will have an annual uh, legislative report that will be coming to you shortly uh, that will provide more information on some of our activity, activities and some of our uh, client examples and initiative examples uh, that, that you can um, uh, look at. And of course, we'll be happy to respond to any questions uh, there as well. And uh, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Larry Johnson. Now, Larry joined our board a, a couple of years, years ago, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, just to say a couple of brief, brief remarks, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, I, Representative Poston, do you want to wait, or would you like to take your question now? Okay, we'll we'll go to okay. Larry. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Larry Johnson. I spent uh, 25 years farming in Carver County, uh, cash grain and a turkey laying hen business. After that, I spent about 30 years now in the ethanol business, um, actually beginning on a contract as a consultant to the Department of Agriculture in Minnesota for about 10 years developing the ethanol industry here. And the Minnesota, of course, really had led the country in development of the industry as we, as we know it today. And uh, we've got 25 ethanol plants here out of about 210 nationwide. I've been on the AURI board now for um, two years. This is my third year. And um, I remember when it began, I was still farming at that time, representing corn down here. And I remember when Perfect uh, created this um, along with some other supporters for, um, I think it was well ahead of its time looking back at it now. We had limited opportunity to add value back in those days, but today it has become so different. Having worked in the ethanol industry for a long time, that began as just making ethanol and, uh, and feed products out of corn. Now we've got the technology, biotechnology, new products that are making proteins and oils and plastics and nutraceuticals and new health foods all out of our raw agricultural products. And uh, it, it really creates more of a need now for AURI and their expertise to help all these entrepreneurs. Uh, a lot of this new technology is expensive and it's very difficult to get at. So uh, it serves a very valuable service today for a lot of the exciting new things that are happening in agriculture and, and value added. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Representative Poston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Schlecht, I hope I'm saying that right. Very good. Um, you went over your financial statement for 2018, and you mentioned that you, you had to dip into your reserves. Mm -hmm. What is your statutory requirement for reserves, and what does your reserve balance look like today? Mr. Schleck. Madam Chair, uh, representative members of the committee. Uh, so we, we have a, a policy uh, as AURI, as an organization, on our reserves policy. Uh, we have a, a policy of nine to 12 months uh, for our reserves of our operating budget, uh, which when we look at our, our biennium funding uh, is a ratio of roughly 0.4 to 0.5. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, our reserves balance uh, today is around 4.3 million. Representative Post. Thank you. And uh, just to follow up on that one too, you did have to dip into your reserves in 2018. Is that was that a one-time situation? Are you, what's the status kind of, of of the balance sheet at this point, Mr. Schleck? Madam Chair, members of the, the committee, uh, so that we have uh, uh, looked at reserve spending the last couple of years uh, as an organization. Uh, we are working hard to grow our funding through um, additional opportunities. We've uh, we switched to our fee for service model. Uh, we are exploring additional federal opportunities as well and other uh, grant and donation. Uh, possibilities so we're we're working hard to grow uh, revenues in other other areas but uh, we do continue to see a lot of demand uh, coming at us and uh, uh, I expect our our um, uh, our work and our budget needs will continue to be uh, around this 4.5 to five million dollar uh, mark into the at least the next few years okay. representative Anderson thanks madam chair yeah my question too is on on the financials and in the the uh, the part in there for the fee for service. Now you mentioned you were had a, had a busy year, and we've talked in the past about doing some work for out of state companies. So, first question is: Is that one hundred and forty-eight thousand uh, dollars collected from Minnesota companies, or also some from out of state folks? Mr. Schleck. Uh, Madam Chair, um, Representative uh, Anderson, members of the committee, our fee for service is um, mainly uh, for services that we're providing to Minnesota clients uh, currently. Uh, we've been very busy uh, within Minnesota, and we've taken a very slow approach to our regional expansion uh, efforts because uh, Minnesota comes first uh, in terms of uh, providing um, our services and, and opportunities to uh, businesses and businesses and clients here. Uh, so, in our, our fee for service um, uh, it ranges in terms of how the the programs or grants might be structured. Uh, so, uh, for example, for for Minnesota soybeans, some of our work for them is under a fee for service instead of a grant basis. Uh, just in terms of how we structured it and, and um, are reimbursed for funding. Mr. Uh, Representative Anderson. Thanks again, Madam Chair. So uh, is all of this from in-state or have you done some work in the past year for out-of-state companies? Mr. Schleck. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, members of the committee, we've done small amounts of work for out-of-state, uh, but very, very uh, minimal uh, in terms of uh, uh, what those number of projects would be. It'd be less than five uh, that we've done out-of-state currently. All right. Um, Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is this. So when you're looking at the fee-for-service model that you currently have, have you thought about how you would take, um, instead of charging more fee-for-service when companies are new, but taking the uh, fee for the value added once they become stronger? Thank you. Mr. Schleck. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, members of the committee, we, we are exploring um, um, many options. Uh, we are allowed by statute to look at licensing and royalty mm -hmm. uh, um, as uh, opportunities, and those are discussions that we are having with some clients uh, that we think would be open to uh, to that type of uh, an approach. Uh, I did sign one royalty uh, sharing agreement last year, uh, actually, uh, and it's just finding, I think, the right um, the right clients that so we can win with the winners, uh, I think, is, as your point is. Uh, and uh, currently, our, our um, our beginning entrepreneurs, we subsidize 80% of the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a, um, we try to keep it very manageable uh, to get them over those first hurdles uh, and moving forward towards uh, commercial sales. Thank you. I think that's a good motto, win with the winners. <laughs> we'll all work on that. Um, any other questions? Thank you very much for the presentation and the information. And once again, we do have three hole punch, so you can put that in to the budget book, but thanks so much for being here today and uh, uh, traveling out in this weather to be able to be here. So we appreciate that. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you. We will now um, be talking about our bill that we have, House File Number 221. And I'm just gonna ask that um, uh, Ms. Oswald, if you'll just come to the uh, testimony table and bring your students with you. Um, I'm going to move House File 221 be referred to the Ways and Means Committee with a recommendation that it be re-referred to the Committee on Transportation, Finance, and Policy. And I'm just going to stay here because you are really the presenters of this bill. So we want to make sure we have a number of, it's a, it's a bipartisan bill. This is one that's been carried uh, last year as well. And um, we know that uh, tr the Transportation Committee will want to um, hear more about it and uh, weigh in on this, but we are excited that you came today and 
that you're able to present. So, Ms. Arsvold, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you, Chairman Poppy and committee members. I'm Val Arsvold, the Executive Director of the Minnesota FFA Foundation. And in just a moment, I'll let these two talented individuals tell you just a little bit about themselves. But first off, I want to thank you for this opportunity and thank you for bringing forward a really unique and wonderful opportunity to provide support to FFA and 4-H programs across the state of Minnesota through a specialized agricultural license plate bill. Um, the two students that are with me tonight are key or today are key in sharing the impact that youth organizations have on our future leaders here in the state in agriculture and our local communities. So with that, they have just completed their third and final day and you'll see all of them have to exit here shortly. They've been involved with the Ag Policy Experience Conference, a wonderful opportunity to see all of you at work and envision themselves in these types of roles in the future. So with that, Nicole and Jerby, will you introduce yourselves? Thank you. Yes, go ahead and welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Nicole Kozalik, and I am a high schooler at the, I'm a high schooler. I'm a proud member of the Randolph FFA chapter. In my very first agriculture class, my ag teacher and FFA advisor, Mr. Terry, asked us, what does FFA stand for? Of course, we responded with, Future Farmers of America, and the National FFA Organization. Very quickly, we learned FFA stands for, really stands for opportunity. And opportunity is what FFA has given me. While my family lives in town, both of my parents have careers in the ag industry. Most nights at the dinner table, we would talk about agriculture. And I never found the conversation that interesting. Once I started taking classes as, in agriculture and joined FFA, everything changed for me. I developed a passion for all things agriculture and understood why my parents, dedica my, de my parents' dedication to the industry. Since joining as a ninth grader, FFA has given me a career path. I plan to go to college and major in ag communications and agronomy. FFA has helped me find a voice through the prepared public speaking contest, which, was, which I was fortunate enough to advance to the national level. I have been to many leadership camps and conferences and volunteer with my chapter on many community projects. I love meeting FFA members from across the nation. Mr. Terry was right. FFA really does stand for opportunity, not only for me, but all FFA members. Thank you, Ms. Kozalek. That's a wonderful presentation. All right, next, introduce yourself and welcome. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Jeremy Salini. I am a senior at the Cannon Falls FFA chapter. Um, I would like to first kind of state a question that I get a lot, um, especially whether it's from friends, family, adults, or whoever it may be in my day-to-day -day life, but I get asked a lot why FFA makes an impact on me, to which I usually get a bright smile and an eagerness and readiness to answer that question. Usually I answer that question with saying, oh, well, it's the love and the kindness and the sense of passion and pride that you get in a youth organization that comes with you, not only to where you are in the home and the school, but also outside of that in, in agriculture in your future. But also, lately I've been thinking of something that reaches far beyond that. FFA, as I get older and I'm now a senior looking at colleges, it has given me an opportunity to look at my career pathway. FFA has given me the choice, whether it was at Apex this week or whether it was at Intense a few years ago, to tour colleges and different career pathways, I have been able to ramp up and get ready for the college that I would like to attend. And within 48 hours, I will actually know whether I've been accepted into my dream college or whether I will have uh, to go to my backup where I can study a career in agricultural communications and marketing and agronomy or plant science. So FFA has given me a pathway that has led me to somewhere that most of my peers that have not experienced the organization are at. A lot of times I see the daily struggle of asking my friends, you know, what they want to do. It's kind of a tough subject. I ask them where they would like to go to college and a lot of them reply with they don't know or they don't know what they would like to study. So for that, I am truly thankful that the FFA organization has helped me as such with org camps and conferences like Apex and Intense that have helped me decide what I would like to go into and pursue a career in. For that, I'm thankful for the FFA and would like to thank you guys for lending your time today. Thank you, Mr. Soini. This is, you know, it's always wonderful to see the blue jackets in these halls and it's always wonderful to listen to the students that come forward because you are you have such great poise and you're articulate and you understand the issues and so impressive. So thank you very much. You did a wonderful job. I appreciate that. 
Um, are there any questions for the testifiers? Chair Poppy, I would share yes. just, and Mr. committee Arzal. members, that's all right. I would like to just share a little bit more about the scope of FFA and 4-H in Minnesota, if I could, and just really what the impact will be on these young people's opportunities. So there are over 22,000 students in agricultural education classes, grades 9 through 12th in Minnesota. 11,000 of them are in the FFA and don the blue jacket. And I'm assuming and know actually that there are some past FFA and 4-H members here in the room, so excited about that. Um, and while they're in our agricultural education classes, they are busy studying agricultural business, animal systems, biotechnology, food products and processing, natural resources and environmental sciences, plant systems, power structures, and technical systems, all valid areas to study and improve the Minnesota economy. But at the same time, while Minnesota FFA is doing things to develop young leaders to be active in their communities as well as prepare for their careers, Minnesota 4-H is doing great things as well. Uh, they're based in every county in Minnesota, and they have over 16,000 students who are actively involved with agricultural programs. So their membership is larger, but as we look at the agricultural projects, uh, those are around livestock, veterinary science, and the science of agricultural programs. So the question that has come up is why an agricultural license plate? And the answer is quite simple. It's an opportunity to celebrate what's right with agriculture and invest in our future. A voluntary way to have Minnesotans show their support. Uh, in 2016, over 665,000 people voluntarily paid an additional fee to support a cause that they believe in. These young people are worth that involvement. So as Jeremy and Nicole so nicely said, success comes to these students who are guided with the help of, of mentors and others. And we ask for this support. Uh, this, the bill has the support and endorsement of numerous organizations, including the Minnesota Farm Bureau, Minnesota Farmers Union, uh, Co Cooperative Network, Minnesota Pork Producers, Compere Financial, Ag Country Farm Credit Services, and the list goes on and on. So we ask for your support in moving this forward as we would like to invest in agriculture's bright future. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you, Ms. Arsfold. Um, Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Ms. Arsvold, you, you touched on it, but I'd like to hear from uh, both of the students on why we should support House File 221, the bill that'll be before us. All right, thank you. So, Jeremy, do you wanna go first? Madam Chair, members mm -hmm. of the committee, I would love to answer that question. So I believe that this is a cause that is very worth supporting because it not only helps FFA members, but it also helps 4-H members um, be able to further uh, grow and explore their passions within agriculture, but it also is a great way of donating and being able to help such great youth organizations. Um, and there, like Ms. Arsvold said, there are so many license plates that so many people are willing and uh, able to volunteer to pay an extra fee for that it is an amazing way to support um, such a well-renowned youth organization. And it is just an amazing way to be able to help uh, youth like ourselves be able to uh, go on experiences like Apex or on Intense or just be able to function within our FBA careers. So I definitely would support it. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Ms. Kozlak? Yeah, Jeremy touched on a lot of the points that I was going to touch on. So just creating the future leaders that we are and continuing to support us so that we can go to the camps and become true leaders. Thank you. Representative Hamilton. You know, Madam Chair, you touched on it, and we've said this before. It does not matter if the students are black, brown, or white, male or female, urban or rural. When the students from the FFA program come before this committee, they are the best and the brightest that the state has to offer. So thank all of you for being here. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. We have some time here. Just was going to ask the young lady from, from Randolph, um, got to meet your chapter advisor back when we did the work on the tractor rollover protection program. And I think your chapter was one of the first to get a rollover installed on your tractor down there for your FFA chapter. How's that old tractor doing? Do you still use it? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, we, we still use it. We actually have over, a little over 10 tractors at this point and we restore them and that's what we're just starting now. So we've got a lot of tractors that we use on our FFA plots as well. Representative Anderson. But they all have rollover bars on them. Most of them. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, 
this bill is um, on this path, on, on a path to go to transportation next. It, it, what it does do is require an additional fee so that if you purchase the plates, you're going to also contribute um, to the Minnesota Ag account. Um, there, a design would need to be uh, created uh, through the Commissioner of Agriculture. Um, then um, those plates would be able to be used and the contributions would be made, as was indicated to the FFA and to 4-H. So um, that's what the bill is. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience who wanted to testify in support or opposition to this wonderful bill? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again very much. Um, and I'm going to uh, renew my motion that House File 221 be referred to the Ways and Means Committee with a recommendation that it be re-referred to the Committee on Transportation, Finance, and Policy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? The motion prevails, and House File 221 is referred back to the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you. Thank you again for attending. Thank you to all of the FFA members. Enjoy your um, trip home. Hopefully safe travels to all. Um, this was a, a good hearing, and I understand, you know, we do have um, weather that's going to get colder and colder as the day goes on, um, but we do meet again on Thursday. This committee does. Um, so hopefully you, you, if you have to travel, you travel safely, and we appreciate um, everyone's attendance today. So with all of that, meeting adjourned. <laughs>